a true Texan, a champion of conservative values, the 47th governor of the great state of Texas, Governor Rick Perry. Thank you, man. All right, thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks. It is a thank you all. That was uh, I, I, David. I always get a charge out of him because he's he's uh, uh, reminds me that I'm not six foot five inches tall on a regular basis. So I thought that was going to be one of his comparables that we were talking about. But he has been a great partner to work with, along with uh, Joe Strauss and. Uh, they are, I will suggest, without uh, stretching it too much, very much the envy of, uh, of the country. But it's a big honor for me to be here today and to visit with you. Uh, a pleasure to speak to a dedicated bunch of legislators at the National Conference of State Legislatures. Uh, you're working together to share ideas with your colleagues from across the country, um, basically to help create and uh, develop public policy in the United States. And I know that the um, conventional wisdom um, of late, uh, it, it, it basically has been top down, uh, that, that that's how our, our country is, uh, works. And, and um, that may be conventional wisdom, but it's not wise. Uh, as I think everyone here can attest, the bulk of the real work gets done at the state level, or at least it should. Uh, and I can understand why anyone could be confused about that fact. With an activist federal government intruding on environmental policy, they've been dictating educational policy, taking over health care, and even interfering with the right of a private company to locate a plant in a right-to-work state, as is the case of Boeing in South Carolina. And one of the points that I've made consistently over the years is that states are best positioned to deal with the challenges that they face, that local governments are, by definition, more responsive to the needs and the directions of their citizens than some official a thousand miles from that state. No one wants a Washington bureaucrat to answer the phone when you dial 911. When there is a hurricane bearing down on your state, you don't want that call for emergency relief to be answered in Washington, D.C. They want local officials answering that call, who understand local issues, to be on the other end of it. This wisdom is written into the United States Constitution. It was crafted by our founding fathers to ensure that each state has the right to govern its affairs in its own unique way. Not only does this approach do a better job of protecting individual freedoms, it also sets states free to explore their own solutions. That's what we mean when we talk about states as individual laboratories of innovation, where new approaches to common problems are field tested, they're refined, they're eventually shared. Maybe what's proven to work in Virginia may work well in Florida. What's working well in Florida may work well in Texas. Now, of course, you all knew you weren't going to get out here today without hearing a little bit about what's working in Texas. <laughs> for starters, you're gathered in a state that's been selected the top state for growth and development for seven years in a row by CEO Magazine, a state that's led the nation in exporting for nine years running, accounting for $206 billion of foreign trade in 2010. That's up 27 percent from 2009. A state that's won the 2010 Governor's Cup. That's awarded annually 
by Site Selection Magazine to the state that has the most new and expanded corporate facilities in the country. A state that's growing by leaps and bounds, adding 4.29 million people between 2000 and 2010, and has the nation, it, Texas has been the nation's top move to destination for the last six years. Now, most importantly, you're gathered here in the state that is the epicenter of job growth in the United States of America. Over the last two years, 40% of the net new jobs created in the United States were created in this state. We're home to 8% of the total population in America, yet 40% of the new jobs created in this country were in this state. Now, those numbers represent so much more than just statistics, because jobs are really not about statistics. They're about a way of life. They're about a quality of life. Jobs are and always have been the fundamental building blocks of a healthy community. Jobs bring security. They bring pride. They bring further opportunity. Aaron, how many times have you heard the story about a minimum wage worker who made their way up to upper management? The mailroom employee who eventually ended up running the company? For any individual, the family that they support, the right job can change their world entirely. The right job opens doors they never imagined for them, for their spouses, for their family. Every job has that potential. Every job has that value. Every job has that power. Our task as creators of laws is to keep an eye on that one fundamental fact to make decisions that ensure the most people have the greatest opportunity to improve their lives so they can make the most of themselves and their communities as well. The effects of job loss are not felt just by individuals alone, or for that matter, even their families. As we've seen time and time again across our country, major job losses, the, the collapse of entire industries can have a devastating effect for entire communities, both large and small. A community suffering such job losses, they might face urban blight, fractured families, increased crime rates, and perhaps most tragic of all, entire generations losing faith in the American dream, the dream that says a better life is out there for them. No government program, no matter how well intended, can fix that. To pay for additional programs, for Government tends to raise taxes, borrow heavily, or in some cases, John, both. And those actions only serve to further depress job creation. It's a vicious cycle that states like Michigan, Illinois, California are struggling to deal with as we speak. The challenges that they face are only going to become more difficult in the midst of this national economic turmoil. The fact is, government doesn't create jobs. Otherwise, the last two and a half years of stimulus would have worked. Government can only create the environment that allows the private sector to create jobs. The single most important contributor to our jobs-friendly climate in Texas 
is our low tax burden because we know that dollars are, that are, are far more better served in the hands of the private sector than in the hands of government. We've kept our regulatory structure predictable. We've limited the red tape that all too often can trip up a small business owner. We've maintained a fair court system. Matter of fact, we improved it with another major tort reform this last legislation, late of session, when these members sitting here in the front rows passed loser pays, uh, a, a powerful component of our legal system. Yeah. It basically says that <clears throat> we're going to let employers spend more time growing their business and creating more jobs than wasting their time being cross-examined in a courtroom. We also developed a world-class workforce. Skilled individuals are ready to compete with their global counterparts for the jobs of the future. These measures have helped make Texas a beacon for employers fleeing the sort of overtaxing, overregulating, overlitigating atmosphere that has taken hold in too many other states. Now, even in Texas, there is no shortage of naysayers who insist we have to follow the lead of some of the other states who frequently dig into their pockets, or I should say dig in the pockets of their citizens, in an effort to avoid tough but necessary decisions about their own budgets. At no point have those voices been louder than in the months leading up to our recent legislative session. But in the end, our legislature emerged with a balanced budget, spent $15 billion less than the previous budget while maintaining essential services, keeping taxes low, preserving more than $6 billion in our rainy day fund in case there is continued national economic distress, or for that matter, if we have a devastating natural disaster in our state. We made the tough choices. We tightened our belts because we know you can't tax and spend your way to prosperity. We also <laughs> we also know you can't place too heavy a burden on employers and families and then not expect them to go looking for greener pastures somewhere else. The economic turbulence of the past few weeks is weighing pretty hard on everyone. But regardless of which way the economic tides may turn, I truly believe our philosophy here in Texas is going to put us in much better position than almost any other state. And that's because Texas practices the physical discipline that Washington can't even bring itself to preach. Current events are indicating which approach is the better one. You know, to, to hear Standard & Poor tell it, our nation's credit rating wasn't downgraded for the first time in, in the history on just a whelm. It was the culmination of reckless culture that has refused to confront spending in Washington, D.C. It took massive debt, and they piled it on the next generation's credit card. S&P also, by as much as what they did not say, is what they did say. They can't complain of spending cuts that were too heavy 
You can't do that. You cannot say that the spending cuts that Washington did, as, as some of those Keynesians would have us believe, we cut too much spending. I don't think so. They also talked about a refusal to address debt in a significant way. S&P laid this out very clearly about what the problem was. They talked about the concern of our debt to GDP ratio and it was unsustainable. Simply put, our country's in trouble. Our fiscal house is built on shifting sands. The federal government has tried to spend our way out of this economic spiral, which has only deepened the crisis and deepened our debt. Until Washington figures out that the only true stimulus is more money in the hands of employers across all economic sectors, as well as a restrained bureaucracy that is no longer overreaching into the workplaces, our national nightmare will continue. Now I stand ready to work with my fellow governors and legislators across this country to return power to the states where it belongs, regaining control over our environmental and educational policies at the state level, stopping the runaway entitlement train that explodes state budgets without giving states any local control on programs like Medicaid. Some out there may say that we're seeing America in decline. But I don't believe that. We're, when I look and see the nobility and the sacrifice, as we did just this last week of our soldiers and Navy SEALs in Afghanistan, when I see Americans going to work every day to make a better life for their children, I know our country's best days are still ahead of us. I believe in this country because I believe in Americans. <laughs> I believe even in this one of our darkest hours. I'll tell you, this West Texas optimist sees our brightest hour is just around the corner. But we're going to have our work cut out for us, and it's organizations like NCSL who are playing a vital role in our efforts to achieve a better future for all of us. I want to thank you again for letting me come and just sharing my heart. I want to thank you for everything that you're doing across this country, all the good works that are occurring in the states. The future of America is truly in your hands, and together we will have an incredibly bright future for our children. God bless you. And Thank you all for loving this great country of America. Thank you.